a tax of some sort. You see where we're going? I think if you read, read on current events, you realize that is exactly what government is suggesting. So you might be thinking that maybe it is a very noble act from the government to rescue the poor from the churches. Things have changed. People ran from the government to the churches as a safe haven. Now, the government wants to rescue people from the churches which are draining them. So the churches have become what now? They've become the most unsafe place and government now is becoming the rescuer. So but my question is that if government begins to regulate the church, to what extent will they regulate it? Will they regulate to a point of doctrine? Will they come to a point where they say, you cannot teach that because that has bad effect on the people. Do you think we're getting there? Are we getting to that point? Because, you see, that is the method of Satan. Create a problem and bring out a satanic way to solve it. So now people are under pressure. No, yes, government must intervene. These pastors are making a lot of money. They must be tax. It's not only going to end on the tax. It's going to culminate to a point of doctrine. Now government will decide what we have to preach on the pulpit. In fact, we are witnessing that happening today. So we have this problem of the false prophet which Satan has created, the Hegelian dialectic. So now that's the problem. So that's the thesis. Now an antithesis or an opposing principle will be what? Government regulating them. So you will wrap these two together to create a synthesis. And then you will have church and state completely amalgamated. And that is what in our prophecy, prophecy studies we call what? The image of the beast. So when the protestant nation, particularly United States, begin to emulate the same hierarchy system of Rome, then the image of the beast is created. And that is a total collapsing of the wall between church and state. So here in South Africa we are seeing that these things are going to come to pass by an attempt to regulate the churches because of the false prophets. So in such a corrupt system, is it possible that if the government begins to regulate the church, the churches will seek to bribe the government to fulfill their bidding? Because they've got false churches. So when you talk about money now, which means the churches can now bribe the government to say, well, we are not, we are against selling the Adventists. Can you silence them? They are affecting our prophet. What happened when uh, Paul preached in Ephesus against Diana, the stages of Diana? The craftsmen and the people that were carving out the stages of Diana said, what? We need to get rid of Paul because it's affecting our prophet. See? That's exactly what is going to happen now. So now, that was just but a mere preamble. My focus of the study today is in John chapter 5. Now go to the book of John chapter 5. We are going to read from verse 1 to 8. It's a very popular text which causes great controversy and I'm not here with all the answers, but I just want to clarify some issues here since we are talking about false miracles and false churches. John chapter 5, verses 1 to 8. And after this there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool which is called in the Hebrew term Bethesda, having five porches. In this lay, in this lay a great multitude of important folk. So these were people that were disabled, they were blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. So now, first of all, listen. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever went then first after, uh, uh, after the troubling of the water stepped was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Now verse 5. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity 38 years. You know this portion of scripture, verse 5, once became my point of hope when I was still suffering with darling sin. And then I realized that there were people that have been suffering in certain condition for 38 years. But yet they were delivered in the end. When Jesus saw him lie, he knew that he had been now long time in that case. He said unto him, Will thou be made whole? And I think that is the statement, that is the question that Jesus Christ is asking each one of us. Regardless of our infirmities, 
regardless of what we are suffering from. It might be the sin that we are, we, are, we, are, we are struggling to let go. I was in that situation myself. And each time when I perform that sin, I always wonder to myself, what is going on? Why do I do what I hate? And I could almost hear the words of Jesus Christ saying, Will that be made whole? Do you want to be complete? Because God has left a vacuum in our hearts that cannot be filled by any pleasure. It cannot be filled in by money. It cannot be filled in by anything. In fact, we'll go up and down seeking for pleasure, thinking that we might satisfy that vacuum. That vacuum, the cornerstone, is Christ. All the struggles that people are going through in the world is because of their searching for something that they do not yet possess. And they will never be in possession of whatsoever they seek unless they be filled with Christ. So hence Christianity is a feeling religion. It's not like Hinduism. In Hinduism, they say, come let us empty you out. Go into a state of uh, nothingness through yoga and meditation. Nothing. How can there be nothing when there is something? So Christianity has weight because it is a religion that fills one's life. So there is that empty vacuum. Now verse 7, the important man answered him, said, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I'm coming, another step is down before me. And Jesus said unto him, rise, take up thy bed and walk. What was Jesus Christ saying? What was, stop trusting in things. The question was, will thou be made whole? Do you want to be complete? And you say, no, it's because my cousin is refusing to convert or to come to church with me. That was not the question. The question is that, do you want to be complete? And that's, what, that's exactly what Jesus Christ is asking us today. So and I want to focus on the issue of this pool and its miraculous deliverance and to see as to whether that is in line with what Jesus Christ is saying. So there's a healing involved in this verse. And there's also an object which facilitates the healing, that is the water. Not only that, but a supposed net supernatural being, there's a supposed supernatural being that comes and does something to the object and the object becomes of power to, 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 to heal, isn't it? Mm. So now I want to draw two biblical events where water has an, has an object of healing. And uh, let's, I'm not going to exhaust all the verses where water becomes an object of healing, but I want us to see the difference between these verses because there are those today who have erected pools in their churches and they, are, they claim that they are emulating the experience of the pool of Bethsaida. And people have to go through their pools so that they may be made whole. So now I want to draw some experiences in the Bible where water was an object of healing. And we are going to look at the differences so that we may approve as to whether that pool of Bethsaida really was an angel that stirred up the water or it was believed that there's an angel that stirred up the water. See? The Bible doesn't say it was believed. But it says that there was a pool. But why didn't Jesus Christ endorse it? Let us now look at the contrast. A very controversial verse. So I want you to put on your guards lest I deceive any of you. I want you to be cautious. I want you to be awake regarding the scripture. Now, turn your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5 verse 10. We know this is the this is experience of Naaman. 2 Kings chapter 5 and that's verse 10 to 12. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth and went away, and said, Behold, I thought you would surely come out to me, and stand and call the name of the Lord his God, and strike his head over the place, and recover the leper. And verse 12, Are not Abana, and he mentioned the name of the river, Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel. May I not wash in them and be clean. So we turned and went in rage. So we know the story of Naaman. He was told to go and wash in the pool so that he may be, he may be made whole. So that's one story where water becomes what? An object of healing. 
Let us look at another experience. John chapter 9, verses 1 to 7. And Jesus passed by. John chapter 9, I'll wait for you. John chapter 9, verses 1 to 7. And Jesus passed by. He saw a man which was blind from his bed. And his disciple asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither had this man sinned, nor his parents, but the works of God should be made manifest in him. What did the disciple believe? If you would allow me to digress a little from our subject. What did they believe? They believed that if you are in a pathetic condition or if you are in a bad condition, it's because of what? Was that a logical belief? Yeah, I mean, if you read Deuteronomy, it talks about the, the curses of not being obedient. But Jesus Christ says, no, it is that the works of God be manifest. You see, we cannot understand the character of God if we do not understand the nature of sin. If we ask, what is sin? We are quick to say, First John chapter 3, verse 4, is the transgression of the law. But there is something that we miss, the consequences of sin. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, two things were produced evil and guilt. Now the cross deals with guilt. 